started. Um, Ellie Van Alten is today's presenter, and she's a retired nurse. She spent the last 23 plus years of her nursing career working mostly as a staff educator in a long-term care facility that specialized in caring for persons with psychogeriatric illnesses. She's also journeyed with her daughter and close friends in their struggles with mental illness. And so I'm going to let Ellie give you a little bit more information about herself and introduce her topic to you now. Thanks, Ellie. It's over to you. Thanks so much, Kim. Well, it's a real privilege to be with you here today. Um, this is uh, one of the topics that is really close to my heart. It's something I'm passionate about. I, I've had the privilege of working with uh, Nellie Sinclair, Ricky Goble, Heather DeBoer, and Mark Stevenson in developing uh, the PowerPoint for this. I, the seed for this was planted um, a number of years ago when Mark came to Edmonton to our Day of Encouragement and we co-presented on um, hidden disabilities. Uh, we did two sessions, one hidden disabilities in adults and one in children. And the message we got at the one in adults was, you know, we'd like to, we'd li we'd like to do more with and for people with mental illness but we don't know what to say to them. We're scared to say the wrong thing. And um, it, that's where the seed was planted for this. Um, you know, um, it's probably the reason why uh, people with mental illness end up on the fringes uh, in our congregations or, or just fade right out because people don't know how to reach out to them. So that's the purpose of this webinar today. Um, the information um, that we're uh, that we're, I'm providing today is uh, uh, not intended as clinical advice. In other words, you know, we we don't want to get a detailed picture of what each of these illness, mental illnesses, involve, um, and because none of us are qualified to do so. This is the area of uh, a clinical specialist. Uh, so we can't answer specific questions about mental illness. However, um, what we can do is help you to better understand how mental illness affects them in their lives and especially how it affects them and their ability to, to attend and participate in, and be an active member uh, of the congregation. Um, I've been presenting this at several of the churches in my classes, um, which is at Alberta North, and, and it's been presented to um, councils, um, church staff, and pastoral care workers. And I've been doing it on an individual basis in each church. Um, and, and because of that, there's a, you know, a really important uh, a message about confidentiality, uh, you know, and, and I've left that in. Um, you know, we're not going to talk about specific examples where we named the person, but uh, definitely uh, whenever, because there's still a great deal of stigma attached to mental illness, um, confidentiality um, is really, really important. Um, in prayers, um, either in groups, in the church, um, you know, um, confidentiality is important. Um, when you name, if if you're if you're thinking of naming a person in your congregational prayer or in your group prayer, make sure you have that person's permission to do so. Otherwise, do it uh, in um, um, a more anonymous manner. Um, and confidential. Confidentiality is also important when journeying with persons who have a mental illness. Um, if you need to share um, with someone about that person, uh, do so only in a situation where you're concerned um, uh, about their welfare. And so uh, the appropriate people to share with them would be mental health professionals, emergency personnel if, if, if you need to call them, and definitely uh, guardians if, if there's guardians in place for these, uh, these people. Um, we really, really, really need to guard against perpetuating 
the either perceived or real stigma associated with mental illness. Um, it's real in other people, and it can be perceived um, by persons with mental illness that there's, uh, there's this stigma still persists. Um, and so we want to make sure that, um, you know, we don't perpetuate that. Just uh, a couple um, statistics, um, <clears throat> and, and we're presenting this in the light of, uh, of 1 Corinthians 12, verse 26a. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. And so the statistics are that 25% of North Americans experience a diagnosable mental disorder annually, okay? Um, for 6% of these people, um, it it's a long-term illness. In, in fact, it's something that they probably will be living with for the rest of their life. Um, depression can become chronic and lifelong. That's not to say it can't be managed, but it, it can become lifelong. Uh, schizophrenia, bipolar, you know, they, these, this is, these are usually long-term illnesses. Um, and, and we would be deceiving ourselves if we thought that these statistics didn't apply to the membership of our churches as well. Uh, you may say, well, I don't know anybody in my church with mental illness. Well, it's probably because they've kept it hidden. Uh, because of the perceived stigma, and uh, but we can we can expect that these same statistics apply. So the goal then uh, of this workshop is to better help you better understand how illness, mental illness, affects people and their families because families need our help and support as well, and. Hopefully, with this knowledge, you will be better equipped to travel and journey with persons with mental illness in your congregation. Um, it's not intended to be uh, um, um, a clinical information. It's to help you understand how the illness affects them so that you can be uh, a friend to them, be on, on, on their journey with them, okay? Journeying with means to support and be a friend to. That's what we mean when we say journeying. We are there to provide caring and support, but we are not to be caregivers. That isn't our role. Um, um, that's, what, that's for professionals uh, in the mental health field. Um, um, just like other people in our church, we're there to be their friends. And, and God knows they need friends because often they feel that they don't deserve friends. And so um, yeah, we're there to, to pro provide caring and support. We are not there to diagnose or solve their problems. Uh, definitely, um, uh, um, you know, we, we, we may be able provide support and assistance, but we're not there to diagnose. And I would warn people against that. Um, it's, you know, sometimes a little information can be more harmful than a lot. And uh, so if you think you're going to be an expert on mental illnesses after this, uh, you know, uh, don't, <laughs> uh, don't expect that. Uh, don't expect you'll be able to go uh, around diagnosing, you know, friends or relatives or, or people in your congregation based on the information uh, that we provide today. Um, we may be able to assist them to access professional help, to go to appointments and, and support them in that way, but uh, that's, the, you know, that, that's where, our, um, where, where things end. Um, we may be able to facilitate their involvement in the life and ministries of the church. And, um, you know, and, and this is where that walking side by side uh, can assist them. They may not feel the strength on their own to, um, to um, you know, be involved. But if you do it together or, you know, something like that, um, 
um, you know, that can help them to be involved. Um, there may not be a cure for their illness. Uh, like I said, uh, for many people, it's, it, mental illness is chronic and lifelong, and so there's no cure. But definitely we can be a healing presence. So where do we start? Well, first of all, I think we need to acknowledge that persons with mental illness are often on the fringes of our churches and may even fade right out of them. Uh, their illness may prevent them from coming to church, being in a crowd, or um, they don't feel welcome, uh, or they don't feel a part of it. Uh, there's any number of reasons. Um, but we need to acknowledge that this is the case and, uh, and start with this premise. We also need to acknowledge that as church members, we have a tendency to leave these persons on the fringes or let them fade away because, as we were told in, the, in, in our presentation at the Day of Encouragement, we don't know what to say to them. We're scared we're going to say the wrong thing. And so instead of, you know, we do nothing and we just leave them be. And so we need to resolve that with knowledge and understanding and God's help, we can help them to belong and, and, and hopefully to serve in our congregations. That's what the, the motto is of disability concerns. Everybody belongs and everybody serves. We've all been given talents by our Lord, and um, we, um, you know, we need to be using them, and these people often need help and support to do so. Once you start journeying with people with mental illness, um, you will probably find, like I did, that um, um, you start becoming their champion. And and, and you start becoming a champion for all people with mental illness. And hopefully you will feel comfortable starting to talk about it in a way that you do about, let's say, diabetes. Uh, like there's no stigma associated with having diabetes. But that's another illness, although it's, it's physical in nature rather than mental, that, uh, you know, there's no stigma attached to that. And uh, if we can start talking openly about mental illness, take away the, the, the fear and the mystery of mental illness, and we learn to, we get to know people with mental illness, learn to get a comfort level about journeying with them. These are all ways that we can uh, help dispel any remaining stigma that remains about mental illness. So what is mental illness? Uh, mental illnesses are disturbances in emotions, thinking, and behavior that cause distress and disability, that interfere with functioning at home or at school or work, and that cause problems in relationships with others. Let me repeat that because it's a mouthful and once we get that in our, in our mind about what mental illness is, then we can start better understanding how it affects them and their ability to function. So mental illnesses are disturbances in emotions, thinking, and behavior. And sometimes it's one or the other. Um, it, maybe I should have said and or behavior. Sometimes it's all three that cause distress and disability that interfere with functioning at home or school or work, and that cause problems in relationships with others. So there's a number of thing, things that, that all, most mental illnesses have in common. Um, many are caused by chemical imbalance, brain damage, uh, and are significant negative circumstances in their life. So it could be one or the other or all of them. Uh, as a result of this, they may not be able to reach out to others for
for support. In other words, their illnesses prevent them from reaching out. And that's why it's so important that we reach out to them because they, they, they may not be able to reach out to us. They may have altered perception of reality, especially if, um, if they have hallucinations or, or um, and, uh, you know, they, they, they literally are in their mind living in another world when they have hallucinations and, uh, and their behavior is, is controlled by, by what is being said to them in that other world. And, uh, you know, that's something that we may have to deal with when we're, we're journeying with people with mental illness. They have, may have impaired judgment. Um, in other words, they may make poor decisions for themselves, uh, decisions that actually make things worse. Uh, people with, with bipolar disorder, for instance, um, uh, when they're uh, in their manic or high phase, you know, they may spend exorbitant amount of m amounts of money and, and money that they don't even have, maybe, they use their credit card uh, on things that really aren't uh, necessary. But, you know, um, the world's their, their oyster at that time, and they're going to uh, do this and do that, and I need this and that, and, you know, they do it all. And then after when they crash, then, of course, then the bills come, too. And, uh, yeah, and, and so uh, because of their illness, they can be the author of some of their own problems as a result. And, and, and we can't blame it on them. We need to blame that on the, uh, uh, on, on, on the illness instead. The other thing is that when a person has a mental illness, there's a huge impact on the family as well. And uh, so, um, you know, part of what, what you know, you're going to learn about is, is how to provide support to families of persons with mental illness as well. Uh, because the stress and the strain is huge. They're the caregivers uh, along with the professionals. And uh, they're the ones that live, you know, with them 24-7 and uh, deal with their behaviors or their, you know, poor decisions, uh, you know, have to, you know, fight, uh, you know, or struggle with, you know, the, the, the altered perception of their reality. So the strain is huge on family as well. So as a church family, we need to be supporting their families as well. So um, what can we do? And, and, and these are some general things that apply to, to all persons with all types of mental illness. First of all, um, we're talking about adults here uh, as opposed to children uh, at this time. And we need to treat them as, as adults, uh, you know, with respect and dignity as a valuable child of God. Um, um, even if their behavior can be childlike at times, it is really important to, to treat them as an adult. Offer our friendship and support. Um, become a safe person for them. Create a space, safe, a safe space for them, both emotionally and spiritually. And uh, we'll talk more about that later. Don't engage in the blame game. You know, the, the, you know, um, try and help this person figure out why me, why is this happening? Um, or as, you know, as, as church members, we may, um, you know, start looking for, you know, it, is it because of sin? Is it because of lack of faith? It just is. The blame game only makes the situation worse. Um, we live in a sinful world, and, and all illness, whether it's mental or physical, um, it is the result of sin. Uh, but we cannot, you know, look at specific instances or, you know, point to someone's face and say, that's why. In fact, often just the opposite, opposite is true. As a result of their illness, they have trouble uh, uh, finding their faith. 
and and so that's why that's one of the reasons why we're there as well. Um, as a person journeying with someone with mental illness, uh, it's so important to be a good listener. Better to be a listener than a talker. Uh, don't offer advice. Um, you know, uh, you may be able to direct them by saying, well, let's, how about if we do this and, and help them make better choices? But to say you shouldn't do that, um, you know, you should be doing this, um, that is not appropriate. Uh, we are not in a position to offer advice, no matter how wise we think we are. Make your presence God's presence in their lives. Uh, and what I mean by that is that, you know, um, you don't need to preach. People, people will know that you represent the Lord uh, just by the way you reach out to them, by the way you talk to them, by the way you connect with them. And it is totally unnecessary to preach. And, in fact, it, we may even make them fear feel more guilty if, if their illness is, is um, you know, affecting, uh, you know, their faith. Offer to pray with them, with them, if they wish, but um, they may not wish to have that, you know, they may not wish to hear the prayer. Uh, they may feel, you know, that they need to be praying to them and feel that kind of pressure, which just makes things worse. So, only if they wish, but certainly, you know, make them part of your personal prayers. And definitely pray as a congregation for them and their families, either by name or, or anonymously, uh, because their struggle is ongoing and they need, they need our, our prayers um, on an ongoing basis as well. So let's get into some specific mental illnesses now and, and, and um, see what kind of specifics we can do about this. And let's start with depression and anxiety. Uh, this is, uh, um, it can be described as feeling sad uh, or down, but this is a normal human emotion that we all feel at times. It becomes an illness when it lasts for more than a few weeks when it becomes more profound and, importantly, when it starts interfering with a person's life and work. Um, anxiety uh, is often accompanying depression. In other words, they're, they're feeling depressed and, and yet they're feeling uh, um, either real or perceived. Um, pressure to to do certain things, go certain places, and uh, and 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 they, you know, because of their illness, they feel they can't. And when they are being pressured, then you know, anxiety results. And so altogether, this results in feelings of sadness, irritability, feelings of hopelessness and worthlessness, and guilt. Um, they may experience a loss in activities, uh, even daily activities, um, um, such as, you know, brushing your teeth or taking a shower or bath or whatever. Um, there's an inability to concentrate, um, um, and, and this is where it becomes difficult for them to go to school or work or, you know, if you're if you're a mother with small children in the home, you know, to meet the needs of children well, there's there can be fatigue and loss of energy, and um, many people with depression and anxiety have complaints of physical aches and pains. Seasonal affective disorder, which is a form of depression that can occur during the winter months, because um, natural light is limited, you know, because days are short, and um, and and these people may may experience an increase in addictive behaviors such as smoking um, or alcohol use. Now, you know, with with how I describe depression and anxiety, you you can see readily see I hope that um, it can profoundly affect. Um, marital and family relationships. Um, eating disorders. 
such as anorexia and bulimia are often associated with depression and anxiety as well. Uh, they become very self-focused, uh, uh, including on their bodies, and uh, they may either overeat and become um, start using food as their drug, um, or they may, um, you know, uh, eat very little and, and, and become anorexic instead. So what can we, what, what can we do uh, to journey with people like this, who experience this? First of all, emphasize the positive. Someone who, who is depressed will, will readily see all the negatives in their life. You know, uh, you know, it, but if you can say, but you know something, this, you did this today, that's really great. That's a positive, you know. Um, definitely acknowledge any effort that they make. Um, they need to be reminded to take time to feel good about the things that they are successful in rather than focusing on what they are not able to do. Um, a sense of humor can go a long way, but make sure that is, it is appropriate. In other words, don't make fun of them. Um, or, uh, don't make fun of their behavior um, unless they do as well. Um, but, you know, using a sense of humor can, can really help to lighten things up a lot. And humor can be rather infectious, and it may help them to find their own funny bone, at least for a little while. Help them to maintain hope that life will improve. Um, um, you know, it's definitely uh, a person who is chronically depressed and anxious uh, needs uh, professional help, and uh, you know that that improvement is not going to come on its own. They may need counseling as well, but uh, you know help them to maintain that hope that that things will get better. Um, be prepared to be flexible. Um, you may plan um, a um, going out for coffee, for instance. You know. Uh, and uh, you go to pick them up, and they're still in their pajamas. <laughs> and and you realize, um, you know, it's not going to happen. And um, you know, rather than scold them, uh, I, you know, um, be prepared to say, hey, well, listen, um, I'm just going out. I'm going to get the coffee, and I'm going to bring it here instead. Uh, you know, so so we can still spend some time together. Um, obviously, because of their illness, today wasn't a day where they were able to go out. Um, I had many such instances with my daughter when I when she was going through her 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 deepest depression and anxiety. We would plan to go shopping or go out for supper or something, and I'd come home from work and um, and and you know she she would still be in her pajamas. She hadn't brushed her teeth, nothing. And um, it, it was her way of saying to me, um, I, I can't do this today. And, you know, I had to reassure her, that's okay, we'll do it another day. Uh, but you know something, let's still have that shower and brush the teeth just so you feel better. And, um, and, and without the pressure of going out afterwards, and, and that's something I learned to, to be with her, and she learned to trust me about that. Be comfortable with silence. Sometimes they're way off in their own thoughts, and uh, uh, don't feel the need to be chatting all the time. Um, you, know, you know, think about your relationships with your family. Are you constantly talking to someone? It's not necessarily. You know, it's okay to be silent at times. Uh, you don't want to spend your whole time together being silent, definitely. And, uh, you know, if they don't really have a lot to say, you, know, you might say, you know, are you uncomfortable? Do you, you know, would you rather go back home again or whatever? Or would you rather I leave? That's fine. But, uh, you know, periods of silence are just fine. Um, 
people with depression and anxiety may not be able to work and, 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 and may have, um, you know, financial problems as a result. And, um, um, you know, a, a referral to the deacons may be in order. And I would certainly be letting that person know, you know, I'd like, I'd like to be able to ask the deacons to help you out financially, you know. Um, and, and if they absolutely refuse, please honor that. Please honor that. Postpartum depression um, is, um, is something that is commonly seen in women, obviously, after they have babies. And um, this is depression that goes beyond the mood swings that can happen uh, beyond the two-week period after delivery when, when hormones are going a little bit crazy. Um, um, and, and what we need to know is that it's experienced by up to 20% of new mothers. So think of all the, 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 the mothers who have had, or families who have had babies in the past year in your church. Uh, you know, um, one out of five will have experienced, you know, uh, a serious depressive episode after having their baby. Um, it can result in both emotional uh, and mental, and as well as physical symptoms. Uh, and it is very important to remember they are not to blame. Don't don't get involved in the blame game here. Um, they are not to blame. It, you know, this kind of a depression is triggered by the change in hormones. Um, the kinds of things that they can experience are, are, are feeling down. They may be very tearful. Uh, you know, they cry at the drop of a hat. They may feel inadequate uh, as a mother, um, as a wife. Uh, they may have guilt. They may have anxiety. They may be irritable. And they may tire easily. And um, in its severest form, people can become delusional and are psychotic. And there can be a lack of bonding between uh, um, the mother and child. And um, in really severe cases, there have been instances where the mother has had thoughts of harming her baby and has actually done so. So this this is really really serious. You know, if you if you even suspect that um, a new mother has postpartum depression, in other words, you visit her six weeks after her baby and and. Uh, you know, she's uh, experiencing this kind of stuff, um, you know, it would be really wise for her to, uh, you know, to, to, to see her doctor and, um, because um, it's not going to resolve on their own. Physical symptoms can include headache, numbness, chest pain, and, uh, you know, hyperventilation. Um, Mothers with postpartum depression may either have no feelings for their baby um, or be overly concerned for the child. In other words, you know, when you go to visit, they won't even let you uh, hold the baby because they're scared, you know, you might drop it or they, the baby might get germs from you or whatever. Uh, and, and both of them can affect healthy bonding with that new baby. So, uh, how can we how can we be a friend to this to a person uh, this mother? Well, be a friend and listen to her feelings. Uh, those feelings are you know it, you know make no judgment about them. Um, if she especially if she's feeling distressed, reassure her that help is available, and, and and encourage her to talk to her doctor about her feelings. Um, you know, if necessary, even offer to give her a ride, you know, to her doctor's appointment if that would be helpful. Um, anybody who has had, uh, has, has been a new mother knows that this is a time of great transition, uh, all kinds of new responsibilities, and they can appear overwhelming at times, and uh, any new mother will have that. Um, but a, a, a new mother with postpartum depression will especially experience that. So 
So offering to babysit for an hour or two so she can have a break, whether she goes out on a date with her spouse or, or has a leisurely bath or goes for a manicure or, or lunch with a friend, um, you know, um, this can be extremely helpful. Bringing a meal is, is, is wonderful. In other words, uh, you know, um, you're, you're, be queen for a day. You don't have to cook today. I'm doing the cooking. So these are all ways that we can help someone with postpartum depression. Next illness is anxiety and panic. Um, this is characterized by extreme apprehension, uneasiness, and intense fear in the case of panic. Um, it is often associated with depression. And uh, like you, people with anxiety and uh, um, panic may, uh, may have various phobias. In other words, uh, you know, scared of things, uh, germs especially and have um, ob ob what they call OCD behaviors, obsessive compulsive. So, you know, if, if they have a phobia about germs, you know, they're constantly washing their hands and surfaces and all this kind of thing. Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder is, is, is also considered an anxiety disorder. Um, and, you know, um, we, we think of our, our soldiers, um, our, our service people, um, who have gone, you know, into Afghanistan and Iran and other places and, and seen horrible things that, uh, you know, um, have affected in a, in a very negative manner. And so, you know, uh, I'm sure we, we have the potential to see, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder in, in our churches. Um, if you have um, uh, people in your church who are of Dutch descent, who experienced uh, the Second World War in the Netherlands. Um, uh, you know, these older folks may um, also experience post-traumatic stress disorder, sort of as a reaction in their, you know, in their older age. And so we can see it in, in the elderly as well. So what can we do? Well. Number one, we can provide distraction and encouragement to relax. You know, when someone is panicking because, you know, they're, they're feeling crowded in or, or closed in in a car or something, you know, um, you know, point out, you know, the scenery outside or encourage them to take deep breaths in through their nose and out uh, through their mouth. Reassure them that what they are feeling is not life-threatening. Many people with panic disorder, um, um, you know, experience chest pain, you know, and it's got nothing to do with the heart. It's not life-threatening. It's, it's, it's muscular in nature, and it's a feeling. On the other hand, don't minimize their distress. It's very, very real to them, and that's why reassuring that it's not life-threatening but definitely don't minimize it because it is distressful to them. Reassure them that you are there for them. And be prepared to be flexible in your planned activities with them. You know, as with persons with depression, their fears may prevent them from carrying through with planned activities. Our next illness is bipolar disorder, and this is characterized by abnormal fluctuations in moods from elation, uh, which is the manic phase, phase to, to depression. So that's the depressive phase. That's why it's called bi or two poles disorder. Um, uh, poorly managed depression may progress, may progress into bi disorder. In other words, if, if people don't get the help that they need to manage their depression and anxiety, they may, uh, you know, it may, it may progress into bipolar disorder. So in the manic phase, it, what, what they will experience is racing thoughts and ideas. They will be restless. They'll be easily distracted. They'll be irritable and excitable. They may be, have impulsive behaviors. They may have some bizarre thinking, you know, 
um, uh, you know, I need a uh, I need a sports car, a <laughs> um, uh, $30,000 sports car um, when their present vehicle is just fine. Uh, they may possibly have delusions and hallucinations as well. And of course, the depressive phase is, is as we talked about in depression. Uh, many persons with bipolar disorder experience predictable cycles to their mood. Um, uh, in my work in the nursing home, I, you know, we would often see that cycle um, where, where um, you know, they, they cycle uh, in the spring and in the fall, in other words, with the change of season. Um, these people invariably need medications to keep them stabilized, uh, but it does blunt um, their, their uh, emotions and moods as well. In other words, you know, they sort of stay on such an even keel that it's, it's um, boring, life is boring for them. Um, the manic phase is, is, is a really exciting phase for them because, you know, they can do anything. Uh, you know, they feel the world's their oyster. And, uh, and, and so it's sort of fun to be in that phase. But uh, unfortunately for a person with bipolar disorder, it's always followed by the, the depressive phase, which is, really, really distressful. So, um, um, you know, it's said that people with bipolar disorder are the people most likely to be um, uh, non-compliant with their medications. And uh, when you see them, you know, at, at one of their two poles, you know, ask them if they're taking their meds okay. That may be a factor. So what can we do? Emphasize the positive and encourage hope especially in the depressive phase, uh, acknowledge effort again. Uh, again, use humor appropriately. Uh, be a calming influence when they're in their manic phase. In other words, you know, like, you know, whoa, 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 you know I can't run that fast. You know, let's, let's just slow down a bit here. Um, be empathetic when they express regret about impulsive manic behavior, you know, when they, when they put, you know, uh, a big bill on their credit card and then, of course, the bill comes and it's, um, then, then they have regrets and maybe by then they've gone into the depressive phase too, so. Um, and, and be positive that, and provide hope that, illness, that their illness can be managed and they can have a positive future. Uh, Person with bipolar will need your support most during their depressive phase. Um, it's their families that need the most support during the manic phase because they're just, you know, uh, you know, running like a like a house on fire, doing things and, uh, you know, especially maybe inappropriate things. Schizophrenia usually starts in adolescence or early um, um, adulthood. It can be characterized by cycles of remission and relapse. In other words, they have good periods and then they go, you know, into poor periods. Um, experience, people may experience one or all of delusions and or hallucinations, and this is very common in people with hallucinations. Um, they have an apparent lack of motivation, um, and that's from our perspective because they are being, you know, ruled by their, the voices or the delusions in, in their head. Uh, because they're involved in that other world in their mind, they may withdraw socially, and uh, their thought disorders uh, that may also involve depression and anxiety. Um, Schizophrenia is one of the most difficult illnesses to treat and manage. Um, medications that are needed to treat it often cause very unpleasant side effects, and uh, so they're prone to be non-compliant as well, uh, which just makes the situation worse. People with schizophrenia can spend long periods in psychiatric facilities, um, uh, um, you know, being treated and getting them stabilized again. So be with them where they're, where they're at, um, you know, accept them the way they are, um, be a good listener. Um, 
don't confirm or deny delusions and hallucinations, you know. They may say to you, don't you hear, don't you hear that person talking? And, and, and be honest and say, no, I'm not hearing it. But, you know, uh, you know I, I, I believe that, that, that you are. Um, reality orientation is, is, has been shown not to be effective. And, and when you try and say, no, it's all in your head, it's not real, um, you may actually alienate them. So uh, at reality orientation is not helpful at all. Simply be a friend and be with them where they're at. Now, there's a whole area of severe personality disorders, psychotic disorders, um, that I, is too extensive to go into. Um, the most challenging to deal with are persons with disorders that cause them to be very, very self-focused. And the potential is there uh, for you to be stuck dry by them. Um, so it's really, really important to set boundaries with them. Um, we also need to be prepared to be rejected by those with disorders that make it difficult to relate to other people. Um, because of their illness, they don't need or, and or they don't want to be in relationship with others. And so they tend to be loners and you can't force yourself on them. Uh, that doesn't mean you don't keep trying to reach out to them and be a friend to them, but, um, uh, but you know, um, we need to, we need to honor that if they don't want to be in relationship. Uh, you know, um, their, their families especially need our support. You know, their, their, their daily struggle to care for them is huge. And, uh, you know, probably the greatest gift you can give to families is, is to give them periods of respite so they can get out on their own and, uh, and, and be relieved for a couple hours or so uh, of, their, of their constant uh, care for this, these people. Just want to talk briefly about suicide threat. Uh, this is when a person has serious thoughts of suicide and or death. The threat may be a cry for help or it may be an expression of their intention to take their own life. Suicide, suicidal thoughts result from feelings of hopelessness, helplessness, and, and that the world, um, which includes their family and friends, would be a better place without them in it. In other words, they feel a bur that they're a burden to their family and friends, and so they're just going to release their family and friends of that burden. Uh, they think they're doing them a favor. They, have, they, they do not have any concept of, um, uh, you know, uh, how distressing that would be to their family. They can't think in those terms. Um, they're just feeling so hopeless and helpless that they think they're better off without me. Now, what would uh, what what would um, you know make you consider that perhaps this person is considering suicide? Well, first of all, they're gifting away value, valued personal belongings. You know, um, you know, giving their iPad to one person, giving their 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 you know, loved pet cat to another, that kind of thing. Um, they withdraw from family and friends. So, you know, emotionally they're, they're, they're already taking themselves out of the picture. Uh, they may actually make final arrangements. Um, you know, if they're planning, you know, make sure that the cat is looked at, pets are uh, looked after, they, they cancel appointments. They may write a suicide note. This is what they consider making final arrangements. They may, they may have feelings, they will have feelings of hopelessness and despair, whether they make them you know, that, that evident to you or not. Uh, there may be a real preoccupation with death uh, to the point where they seem to be talking and joking about death. So what can we do in a situation like that? First of all, ask them if they're taking their own life. It is really, really important to know that this will not push them to do so. It will give you an opportunity to assess whether they actually do have a plan. So ask them, you know, how were you planning to do this? How were you planning to take your life? And then let them know 
that this is a time where, you know, this is a situation that is beyond what you can can deal with and that for that person's sake and your sake, that professional help is needed and that you're going to contact emergency services and dial 911 if you, if you, uh, if you feel that it's that imminent and stay with them until help arrives. So, because, um, you know, uh, if their talk is, a, if their talk of suicide is a cry for help, then this is the opportunity to help them access the help that they need. Very, very important. There is nothing that you can do to prevent someone from committing suicide who is determined to do so. If they don't do it today, they will do it, surely do it another day. Uh, they do so because they feel they have no other option. So um, I don't know how many of you have experienced uh, the suicide of a friend or family member. Uh, I um, have experienced, uh, you know, the suicide of a good friend of mine, and yet first we all questioned as friends, you know, you know, why didn't he talk to us? You know, why, you know, we could have done something. No, we couldn't have. You know, if they don't, if we manage to, you know, talk them out of it today, they'll do it another day. So we can't, you know, it, they, it is not our responsibility. We cannot feel guilty. And, and if you continue to feel guilt about, uh, you know, uh, when, if some, a friend commits suicide, it's really important to get help to deal with it. Because it will, it will um, affect you for the rest of your life in a negative manner if you don't. Okay, how to build relationships. Get to know who they are as a person. Accept them for who they are. Mm. Uh, they are also made in God's image and one of his precious children. Ask them to help you understand how they feel. Be a helpful friend and safe person for them and ignore bizarre behavior. Don't get into the trap of identifying them uh, by, their, by their illness. Um, it's really important to set boundaries and avoid burnout. It's really easy to get swallowed up and sucked by really needy persons with mental illness. So decide how much time you are prepared to spend with this person and be firm in sticking to that time. Let the person know how much time you have to spend with them and what that time will look like. In other words, what you're going to do together. And don't be afraid to say, say no if necessary. And this also applies to, to, to answering phone calls from that person. You know, if you've already talked to them three times a day, it is appropriate to ignore the, the phone. You, you have your life to live as well. Um, encourage and facilitate if the person needs professional help. If the person is very needy, consider asking for help. Uh, in other words, set up a team of church members to help meet their needs. Make sure you don't neglect your own needs and those of your family. Self-care is, is essential. Pray. Uh, get prayer partners to cover you if, um, if, if you know, especially if, if, if um, you know, you are feeling some stress by this. And get professional help if needed for yourself, for that person and make sure that you heed the advice, uh, uh, the advice of, of, of professionals. And this applies to you pastors as well. I have a pastor friend who actually retired from his church because he didn't have support of his counsel in dealing with someone who was psychotic. And, um, you know, um, pastors are at risk too. You have to learn to set boundaries as well. Everybody belongs and everybody serves. That's what our mo motto is. Help persons with mental illness who identify the gifts that they may be able to use in the church. Um, support them in their efforts to participate in church activities. Except if the person says they are un unable to attend worship service, they may, may be more comfortable in a small group uh, uh, Bible study situation. 
Um, see if there are things they can do from home for the church, things like putting together or for holding bulletins, making phone calls, sending reminder emails, making posters or banners. Check with them whether they're able to do what they plan to do. Let them know it's all right if they can and be prepared to go to plan B. Barrier, possible barriers to our journey with persons with mental illness, uh, the stigma of mental illness, both real and perceived. Perceived is just as uh, um, problematic as, as uh, real stigma. Um, um, shame about mental illness uh, is why people don't talk about it, they're ashamed. And our personal biases about il uh, mental illness, like do, do, do we consider it uh, the, the measure, the result of lack of faith or sin of the parents or, or that it may be infectious, that you can catch it. Uh, and, and of course, we're all colored by our perceptions of uh, false, perce uh, false perceptions uh, uh, of, of what is portrayed in movies and on television. So where do we go from here? You know, uh, do we need more education, more resources? Um, um, you know, perhaps consider um, doing a, a, a study on the book A Compassionate Journey by, by uh, John Cook. Um, maybe we need to do a Let's Talk study. These are all resources that are available. Maybe we need to develop wraparound teams or glue teams teams or circles of care or what, health care teams, whatever. Um, you know, what are the needs in your church? Ellie, I'm going to need to break in here as we're wrapping up to let people know that our question and answer period is going to take place once you get through your last couple of slides and if they can stay around for it. Um, we're going to be continuing a little bit longer today, but we're going to be wrapping up the official portion of the webinar just as soon as you get through your next couple slides. I just wanted to let the people know we are going to run a little over today. And so I'm going to turn it back over to you. Okay. So 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3 to 5 says, Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, and that includes our mental health pro uh, troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. But just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. So that's the, you know, that's our reason why we're reaching out to these people. Uh, if you would like to discuss more with me uh, on, a, on a private level, you can certainly email me. I will uh, make my best effort to answer, uh, discuss anything you want. Um, um, I'm retired, so I have some time. And uh, I want to thank you very much for being a part of this. And uh, hopefully this will benefit you in your, um, in your work in, in, in your own church. Thank you ever so much. We appreciate all of you that joined us today, and I just got a little bit more instruction, and we will be continuing on with the Q&A session. It's going to follow immediately after I give just a little bit more information. Um, if you enjoyed today's discussion and you want to continue the conversation at the Disability Concerns Forum, you can find that on the network on this address that's showing up on the slide here. We ask that you fulfill uh, just one small request for us, and that is to complete a survey about how we did today. It will pop up in your browser at the end of today's webinar. And our next webinar is next Wednesday, Autism and Children's Ministry, presented by Nella Eitvlucht on uh, Wednesday, October 3rd, 12 noon Eastern Daylight Time. And you can always find out what's going on with webinars at www.crcna.org forward slash webinars. You can vote. You can look at recordings. Uh, you can look at upcoming uh, events. Or you can subscribe to the weekly subscriber updates at crcna.org forward slash network. And we'll hope you'll join us again. And now we're going to go to our extra uh, question and answer session. And I see that we've got a few questions um, queued up uh, already for Ellie today. Uh, thanks for those of you that can remain with us. Ellie, got a couple of questions here for you. Um, okay. Gail, uh, Gail's asking, 
what kinds of structures, volunteers, or programs can be put in place in a church to help facilitate persons with mental illness serving and participating in the church? Well, um, it depends on the needs. Uh, you know, uh, um, they're so individual because mental illness um, manifests itself so so individually in e each person, you know, differently in each person. And so it really needs to be based on the need uh, of that person, um, um, but uh, depends on how much, um, what shall I say, time, you know, um, they are needing from us, you know, whether, whether one person can be, can, can, can be that person, ideally, you know, several, uh, you know, that you work as a team and, 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 you know, you take turns, you know, visiting that person, going out for coffee or lunch with them or um, taking them to appointments. Um, you know, that, that takes the, you know, onus off of the one person doing it all the time. And I, I think it also enables people to, you know, if, if, if they're having some concerns or issues with the person with mental illness, they can talk together about it and, and, uh, and pray together about it and access, you know, any help that they need. Um, so it, it, it's very individual. And, you know, if, if someone, I mean, if the person, if Gail is interested in email me, if she has a particular situation in mind, definitely email me and, and, and we can talk about it because, um, yeah, it, you know, it, yeah, it's so individual. It's so individual because, it, you know, you're dealing with individual personalities. You're dealing with individual ways in which their illness manifests itself. And it, it, you know, and it's very individual how um, how they respond to other people in the church. Yeah, it's and a I'm challenging sorry. question. <laughs> it's a challenging question. That's the best we can probably do in the time frame today. But we'll put Ellie's email address up again on the screen. Ruth is asking a, a good question. This would be one I would share. How do we help people who do not want to go to church because it makes them feel more anxious? Maybe they got a fear of crowds or fear of sin or improper prayer or they're going to do something wrong. How can we make them feel welcome in our worship services and help their families to be able to engage in the service as well? Um, well, I, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think of, of people who, um, who have people in their family who maybe have some noisy behaviors or perhaps, you know, challenging behaviors in church. And boy, you know, if your church can, can, can learn to, you know, not see them as interruptions, but as, uh, like uh, I know Mark Stevenson last week in his webinar talked about his daughter Nicole, and you know she can she can get verbal and uh, and very excited when she hears her favorite song, et cetera, and and you know and, and that's her way of praising the Lord, and and that that's you know if we can if we can learn to to tolerate that and uh, and and see the positive of of that that a huge help but uh, you know for people who get really anxious in the large crowd situation um, you know uh, perhaps um, they'd like to sit at the back and we can make sure that they have a spot in the back because then if they want to sneak out when things they get too uncomfortable they can do so uh, some churches have uh, you know what they call um, the cry room where people with little children who want to stay at the service but who have noisy, perhaps noisy children can go into and, and, and that room may be much more comfortable for them so they don't feel like they're part of this great big crowd which makes them um, uh, very uncomfortable. Also, um, you know, small group Bible studies may, may work much better for them so if you can get a group together and, and you know, uh, maybe even let's say on, on a Monday night and talk about the sermon, you know. Um, so that they can learn what the congregation, you know, uh, had the privilege of, of learning about, you know, when they were in church on Sunday. Um, yeah, different. There's different ways of, of dealing with it. But, okay. but my, I challenge you 
as a congregation to, um, you know, uh, find a way to include them. Try to put a positive spin on having having them there, and and so that we can, you know, genuinely welcome them. Okay. Uh, we've got a couple of questions that were sent in on registration forms that I'd like to ask you now. How do we treat those with mental illness differently than those with mental disability? Well, <laughs> I, I don't think we should treat them differently at all. I mean, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, um, we tend to avoid them. That's what what has often happened in the past. And, and I mean, they like people to come up to them and say hello to them and did you have a good week? And uh, you may get more, more of an earful than you're prepared for, but just politely listen and say, I'm sorry, and I hope this is going to be a better week and uh, share something about yourself. I mean, relate to them just like everybody else, you know? Um, Every to me, there's, you know, there's not a difference. Okay. So if you're not prepared to, to really listen to them and engage with them, then, then um, yeah, I, you know, if you're not prepared to get to know them, et cetera, then perhaps you end up not talking to them at all because, yeah, but they want, you know, like they, they have the same needs as everybody else. And they're all image bearers of God. So um, keeping that for, in the forefront is something I learned in Mark's webinar last week as yes. well. Is it's people first. It's it is. set aside the behavior. It's people's first. Yes. So right along those lines, here's our, our our final question: How do you help persons with mental illness to understand and come to a point of acceptance of God's plan in their disabilities? Um. You know, we may not be able to do that, or we may not know that that we were successful in doing that. Uh, the nature of their illness is that it does, um, you know, they feel that they they don't have enough faith and that they're not worthy. Uh, that's the nature of uh, of many of the mental illnesses. And so, um, you know, if we if we can communicate to them with conviction. Uh, that God loves them and cares about them and will give them strength to bear, you know, the burden of their illness, um, you know, that, that, that may be the best that we can do. Uh, I talked about not preaching to them, you know. I mean, it may be as simple as, you know, when you're saying goodbye, you know, don't forget God loves you, <laughs> you know, and... When a person hears that over and over again, uh, they may, you know, they may actually start believing it, especially if they sense, that, you know, that you genuinely mean that, you know, um, yeah. and that's being, you know, Christ's presence in their lives. Well, thanks so much, Ellie, for your presentation today, and thanks for all of you that stayed on a little extra. And um, I'm going to take us back to Ellie's contact information, lev at telus.net, if you'd like to email her uh, about any questions that may not have gotten answered or if you'd like a little bit more illumination on some of the information that was covered today. We did have a very full webinar, and I think referring back to the slides may be something that you'd want to do. And just to let you know, there is a recording of today's event, and it is uh, at uh, www.crcna.org forward slash webinars. That's where all of our webinar information is. So we hope that you'll be able to join us again in a webinar soon, and we thank you for investing your time in joining us today. Thank you so much, and see you next time.